Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this second webinar presentation by the Robinson Jeffers Association and the Tor House Foundation. I'm Melinda Coffey Armstead, and I am thrilled to be the moderator here, bringing all of us together in a new net of gems, exploring the work and the life of Robinson Jeffers today through music. We have Chris Anderson Batsoli and Jessica Hunt with us. And you are in for a treat. These are two brilliant young composers just at the beginnings of careers. Chris has made a fantastic CD, I will show you. Gorgeous performance, beautifully recorded setting of nine of the poems. And Jessica has, has an entire opera under construction. So you'll hear two bits of that today. Um, we are limited to exactly 60 minutes. We'll play music for you first. You get to hear Distant Rainfall from Chris's album, Song Cycle of Nine Poems of Jeffers. And then you'll hear Helen's aria from Jessica's opera under construction. And those are wildly different emotional experiences. So you're in for a roller coaster ride. Jessica, shall we start with the music? Absolutely. Just All give right. me a second here to bring up the text so we can follow along. And actually, sorry about that, folks. I need to change a sound setting first. All right, now we can do this.
And Melinda, I muted you during, oh, during the play. There you are. <laughs> wow. Congratulations to both of you. That was very powerful. I know I, I have questions for you, and I know people who are watching will have questions. So I just want to let them know they can post them into the question and answer box, and they will be fielded to us. And we will try to answer some of those. But right now, I want to get the two of you talking about how you found your way to Jeffers and how you, you began to imagine that you could transform the poetry into a musical event, a musical expression of his poetry. So um, maybe Chris, you go first. Since we heard your song first. Um, yeah, well, thank you. And uh, it's been a long journey. Uh, I grew up in Pacific Grove, first of all. So I you know, spent my formative years in Jeffers country. And uh, I even uh, had um, Lindsay Jeffers as a, as a teacher in high school. Uh, so I knew the Jeffers name from about that time when I was a teenager. Uh, but, and I, I think we even studied Hurt Hawks in an English class, but even at that point, I, 
I didn't quite catch the bug yet. I don't think I was quite ready to hear it. But a few years later, I think it was in probably a junior at UCLA, I moved to Los Angeles after graduating and I was home uh, for summer break. And uh, I wandered into the Thunderbird bookstore. <laughs> if everybody remembers that at the mouth of the valley. And I picked up this guy, mm. which is nice and still has road wear on it. And I still have my Thunderbird bookstore uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, bookmark in it. And uh, something was different about it. I really connected to it at that point. I read Roan Stallion and it just, it really hit me sideways. Um, it really transformed kind of this area that I knew as a child and had grown up in. And it just automatically opened up this kind of mythological dimension to this place where I'd grown up, which was extremely powerful. And uh, I actually did set one or two poems as student pieces uh, because I was immediately inspired. I'm like, okay, this is somebody whose work I would like to, to try setting to music. And I don't think it was terribly successful in my opinion, uh, those student pieces. And it actually took me quite a while before I was ready to, to sit down and make a big piece out of it. It took me about 10 years of living with the poetry and writing other music and getting myself to a point where uh, I thought I could um, do it justice on whatever level I, I was able to. Um, so part of that process was actually learning to bring improvisation into my working process a lot more, especially with my voice. I started singing a lot, um, not necessarily performing, but in terms of my compositional process, I started singing all the time. And I thought one way that I, I should approach this work to make it true to me instead of worrying too much about, you know, whether there's a right way or a wrong way to do it, uh, to just make it very personal. And like with a lot of my other compositions, I'll just go into a quiet room. There's no piano or anything. I'll just turn on a recorder, be in silence for a while and just sing the poetry. And I did several different versions of every poem, um, often very different. So that piece you heard is very much just like a moment in time for me in terms of the composition. So I would record the voice myself singing it. And the version I thought was the most interesting, <laughs> I would take it and, and um, start to build a piano accompaniment around the melody that had come to me spontaneously. I have a question. And so did that's you, uh, how that happened. Did you walk or pace while you were doing these vocal improvisations? Absolutely. Actually, no, that's exactly I, what Jeffers did as he was upstairs in the cottage, pacing back and forth, working out the line length and the, and the rhythm of the lines. So you actually took his method to find a melody line. Yeah, and it, it, that's true of all my work, I would, I would say. Um, and, you know, I just think that music musical gestures are gestures and they should really come from the body yeah. um, as much as the intellect. And um, so it's a very interesting balance, I hope, between kind of instinctual, uh, you know, left brain spontaneity. And then when I get to the piano and I start studying what I had done and looking at what the harmonic implications are and what it suggests uh, is more where the sort of craft of composition takes over at that point. Yes. Um, Jessica, what about you? I've listened to some of your early work and it's not like Jeffords at all. You have explored a very wide range of material. So why, what, what brought you at long last to this very tragic mythic material? Well, uh, I'm very lucky to have grown up in the household that I grew up in, in terms of being somebody who would eventually become interested in Jeffers. I kind of have my own personal curator in, in the family, which is nice. Um, so uh, my first uh, exploration of, of Jeffers was actually art song. And uh, I was very lucky that Tim Hunt, my dad, he pulled a bunch of poems he thought might be short enough to think clearly on. I was 17 at the time, you know, so these were very much student pieces as well in a way. Um, and what really struck me was looking at this text and suddenly hearing melody. Mm. So as I was reading, melody was already there in the words. And so it was a matter of figuring out how big should that be? If there's a contour that has this shape, mm -hmm. how extreme does that contour become when it's musicalized? 
Um, and so, you know, years later, I was like, okay, I'm ready to move on to some opera. You know, I love musical theater. I love drama. I'm like, Dad, does Jeffers have any poems that would make a good opera? And he's like, what about Thurso's Landing? So I read it. And it's basically the most opera poem that has ever poemed. <laughs> I mean, there's everything in it. And these characters are so extremely human, but also larger than life. And it has this wonderful sense of this Greek epic mythology in there as it is it's still existing as part of this 20th century dialogue that Jeffers is, is working with and against and informing. And so for me, it's a very different experience when we're looking at a poem by Jeffers where we're looking at his poetic voice versus one of his narrative works where he is inflecting character. So who is Helen? What does Jeffers think of Helen? And how would he be pacing and saying these lines for her as he's working? So my process is also very physical. You know, I, I recite, I learn it like a dramatic monologue and I recite and I do dramatic staging and I probably look very, very silly in a room by myself, you know, doing these things and thinking to myself, what would a singer enjoy and what opportunities can I give for dramatic expression in the voice? Uh, so yeah, very, very physical. We have, you know, very similar approaches and I, I think Jeffers kind of calls for that in a way. So you work it out as a one woman show, basically. <laughs> In, in by, yeah, yeah, that must be so fun. But by choosing a narrative, your your dramatic arc and your structure is given to you right there. Mm. Chris, you had to choose nine poems to put together to make a cohesive song cycle. How did you do that? Well, you know, anytime you're creating a musical musical work, you're you're creating a piece of drama anyway. So even though it's you know there there are lyrics, when you're putting somebody on a stage to to sing songs to people, there's a you always have to think about the dramaturgy of it, right? So um, the first thing, you know, I had a lot of candidates, um, but I thought that it would be interesting to, to make it cohesive, try to mainly stick to the nature poems, kind of the strictly nature poems that had at least a perceived um, kind of singular narrator or point of view so that that, that part of it worked. Um, the only, uh, exception to that is that I did set science, which gets into a little bit more politics and his inhumanism um, type of statements. Um, so that was for variety. Um, but, you know, there's also this, you know, this problem of tempo. You know, every uh, poem seems to suggest a tempo, and I'm sure it'll be different for each composer. But um, I had to find some that I thought were were slow, like the one you heard that was, was the slowest. It's like a dirge. Uh, and Evening Ebb, which is the final poem of the cycle, is also um, a bit like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also uh, the poem um, Fire on the Hills, which to me is, you know, the deer were bounding like blown leaves on the, you know, and, and it, it suggests a kind of buoyant, fast tempo. And so I had to think about that also in terms of creating variety. Um, and then Continent's End, which is of course the big centerpiece, um, that almost feels like an opera on its own because there, there's just so much in it. Um, so that goes back and forth, you know, so th that's kind of the way I was thinking about which ones ended up being chosen. Yeah, and the, and the center of gravity is in the center of the cycle with Continent's End, right? It's true, yeah. Now you both also chose a female voice of um, which interested me because I mean so you could imagine that a composer might think of Jeffers own voice write these for a man but his his work is so full of powerful toxic women that <laughs> that must be the irresistible pull right to put put the words in that mouth is that was that how you arrived at the mezzo soprano casting oh, is that for me also yeah um yeah, definitely. I mean, when I think of Jeffers, I think of the characters. I think of the yeah. Cassandra poem. I think of Medea. I think of California from um, from Roan Stallion and uh, all those amazing characters. And I, I also feel like, how can you not? How can you do something without acknowledging the ever presence of Una there? You know, and it just feels like part that decision was part of that. I mean, having said that, I could just as easily do a version of this cycle for a tenor or for a baritone. Um, 
because the music, especially vocal music, it, it can work that way where it can work for, for a variety of voices. And that, that would be an inter interesting thing to, to perform at some point. I haven't done that yet, but I just thought for this initial pr premiere and it's recording that, uh, and it's, I got to give a shout out to Buffy Baggett too, who's amazing. She, that mezzo. And she, she is, she's totally like a Jeff or Sarah. When she's I don't know. She is very powerful presence on the stage. And, so and you didn't make it easy for her by having her end on an E vowel up high on beauty. I thought, oh my God, this, this is a, this is a really wonderful singer who could handle something like that. So yeah, um, I, I yeah. sang it that way. So I guess she had to. <laughs> I E vowel. Wow. <laughs> um, and now I want to bring it back to, to Jessica as well. Um, I have an interesting question here posed by someone who knows Jeffers poetry very well. And he says, Jeffers' poetry is sometimes dismissed as prose chopped up into lines. Do you find a musical dimension in his writing? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like what he's doing with beat is particularly interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I do is I go through and I underline the syllables that land. Huh. And then I'll measure how many other little unaccented syllables are in between and, you know, these kind of asymmetrical poetic feet. Mm -hmm. And so I see that it's not ametric, but rather that it's freely metric. Mm -hmm. And so as Jeffers is uh, adding extra syllables or expanding these lines or what he's doing with punctuation will will sort of indicate a different mode of delivery. Uh, delivery. So. I, I, to me, it's extremely musical and just knowing the story of Pace Robinson Pace and knowing that he's composing with his voice, for me, that there's no way to separate that musicality from the text that ends up on the page. Is it hard though, writing for, say, for conventionally trained musicians to, to, to fit these lines into standard meters? Ooh, well. I tend to not do standard meters, I, I know, as you I might know. have heard in the aria. Well, I heard, I heard a little bit of, you know, a little bit of regularity here and there as yeah. a special effect. It's a, it's a special effect when it shows up. Mm -hmm. then. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's, for me, meter is symbolic. And, you know, there's something about three, four that has this very one feel. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, one, two, three. There's something inevitable about a three, four. Mm -hmm. And so there's a choice to go into that. And it's not necessarily based mm -hmm. on what the meter of the poetry is doing but what the character of the poetry is doing. So uh, for me, I actually compose without bar lines at all. I do these oh. little X note heads. Yes. So they're, they're not even exact pitches. Oh, wow. And I'll, I'll sort of X notate some contour and some vague proportional rhythm. Yes. And then I'll be like, ooh, that measure right there, that would notate well in two, four. Mm -hmm. And ooh, even though this is kind of five, 16, and then seven, 16, a vocalist would hate me if I did that. Let's do two exactly. bars of... Of exactly. six. Yeah. I hate you when they refuse to sing it. Yes. <laughs> well, but it's it's also um there's a difference between notating what the content of something is and what is useful for performance. So I'd rather notate a little bit of syncopation here and there or asymmetry across a bar line if it will facilitate ease of rehearsal. So sometimes what the meter is and what the meter looks like in the score can be two slightly different things. It's interesting, your comment about three. Um, as, as bipedal creatures, I think, you know, everything is bilateral symmetry with us and we have, we have two hands and two feet. Anything in three has a different feeling and somehow has more, what, power? More, more spiritual power or psychic power if you, if you deal more in threes than in even numbered sets. That's really so, interesting. So I mean, it's, it's just just a thought because your your comment about three, Chris. Do you find that at all? Was it? When, how? What is your rhythmic process in setting the text? Well, like Jessica, the, the drawing of the bar lines comes very late in the process, uh, and it's it's again. I, I think being a modern composer, we're just not as I, I generally don't think in meter that much anymore. I think especially with Jeffers, it's more interesting not to. I think it should be free. Jessica's piece feels very free metrically. Mm -hmm. And that's how I read Jeffers. I mean, I know that there is a lot of sophisticated meter embedded in it, but I, I don't read it that way. And I don't think the music of Jeffers is that way um, for me. 
I, I you know, you probably saw in my piece, it's the, the phrases of the music don't, they don't even really necessarily line up with the line breaks. Um, they're much more uh, about the content and the ideas. And as I said, I might have done a completely different um, version when I was in a different mood on a different day, you know? So it's, it's not, it, it needs to be malleable like that. Poetry should be that way, I think. Mm. How long did Can you- Can I actually ask a, Jessica a question? Because no, on that please. topic, I, please, please. one of the things that I think is so interesting um, about the ending is actually the placid mm. moments, you know, and just that very bare, high floating thing in the, in the last few few um, words there. And you've, you've created such a striking um, dichotomy between the violence of it and that very peaceful ending. I was just curious if, you know, if that's something you thought a lot about and, and uh, if you agree. <laughs> oh yeah, thank you for noticing. Um, yeah. For me in this aria, I mean, the text is drawn from chapters 16 and 17, but in terms of the placement in the libretto, this is actually happening analogous with events in chapter 22. So these are kind of like the internal thoughts that Helen has been holding on to and waiting for a moment to sing about because it would be uh, dramatically unsatisfying to have this kind of aria where she convinces herself that she needs to take this dramatic action and then we wait for a scene and a half for her to do it. <laughs> we it. sort of need the decision and then the action uh, in terms of just the drama on the stage. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really wanted to make sure that this aria, that moment of realization where she really truly makes the choice to commit this murder, I wanted to make sure that that moment of realization was extremely highlighted and in an aria that is so turbulent and violent and hyper textured and lots and lots of stuff going on it's sort of okay well what can i do for contrast here yeah, and, and that the music's kind of... so fragile i think that's yeah. really really interesting in that moment in the Thank moment you. of most intensity emotionally you're the most sparse which i think is a terrific um, decision Thank you. I'm, that's very much a Minotti moment. I'm not going to lie. I, I love Giancarlo Minotti. And I think that he does amazing things with dramaturgy and character and helping us really hear those moments of decision. So that's yeah. that's me fangirling over Minotti. <laughs> if we're, we're going to talk about influences, you may notice that I'm kind of a Hindemith guy. I really, mm -hmm. I love uh, Das Mari and Leben, which is a wonderful cycle. And uh, some, of the, my, some of my harmonic language definitely Owes, owes a debt to, to Hindemith. And I, I'm a huge Britain fan too. My favorite mm -hmm. opera composer is Britain. And uh, yeah, I feel like his influence is in there as well. Totally. I was actually going to ask you, Chris, since now we're asking each other questions, can you talk a little bit about that pedal E and kind of how that inflects and informs your setting around your vocal line? Because you were talking about writing that vocal line first and trying right. to find harmonically how to situate that. So what about that E kind of contextualizes that line for you? I mean, it's so effective. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, it's, the, you know, it's the ground of, of being there that I used that low note on the piano. And it's just something you have to spend time, you have to listen for it, you know, and it, that's a long process. The, obviously the process of composing the piano and getting to know what I had done was much longer than, you know, the singing is literally as long as the piece takes, but I love um, having a, giving myself just a big chunk of clay to work with in the vocal line. And even if it's not a vocal piece, if, even if it's just a lead line, it's, you know, I immediately have something that's a complete form that I can just start to work with. And so that low E just was that note by instinct that I thought would unite, you know, this journey. And this is one of the only songs where uh, it begins and ends in the same way. Uh, you know, in academic parlance, you'd say, you know, my, my work is through composed, which means that it, you know, starts one place and it don't look for recurring themes because there aren't any, it just goes, it's a journey, goes from one place to the next, but distant rainfall was one of those, uh, songs where I was able to discover a way to get back to where I started. And, and, uh, and that was, I thought inherent in what I had sung. It's so fascinating when the tempo really picks up and 
things sort of broaden with the register and you go down one half step. And that's so effective. It's like that contrast I don't expect, but I really need. It's so, so effective. We're always, I feel like, you know, we're always looking for um, harmonic interest in everything and especially when it's unexpected. And I don't know about you, but as a composer, I don't really feel pressure anymore to have some kind of a large harmonic architecture that's supposed to unite it and that it would stand up to some kind of Schenkerian analysis or some, you know, some kind of academic analysis. I just, I stopped thinking that way a long time ago. I, I've much more intuitive. So any of those surprising harmonic things that I arrive at just happened in the moment. Very cool. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just thinking about um, harmonic structure and, and uh, I wrote this aria first actually and I'm, it's basically the uh the the big what is it called the cornerstone in terms of all the other musical vocabulary for the opera so then it was going back to act one scene one and trying to find ways to hint at arriving at this aria mm -hmm. so i i had a very opposite experience with with this particular piece just because there has to be some sort of logic for if you're gonna have a two-hour piece. <laughs> yeah. So, are there things in that aria that uh, where you, there's material that's developed from the previous scenes, and uh, I guess we'll find out when the opera's finished. But uh, <laughs> just curious if you're if you are thinking about that larger architecture, because I notice you use, you know, you use scale or movement a lot um, mm -hmm. as a kind of device, as a as a as a device. You know, there's certain sections where there's stepwise upward movement, stepwise down, and then you have the contrast of the, you know, steady state stuff. Um, yeah. It'd be interesting to hear you talk about that a little bit. Sure. Well, there's one of the gestures that ends up in various kind of harmonic places or juxtaposed against uh, that gesture at different transpositions. Those are the first four notes that Helen sings. Isn't he unusing that one? And Rick Armstrong, the dynamite man. Um, so for me, that's kind of the motor that sets off Helen's eventual downfall and demise. And it's this expression of uh, inevitability or feeling like she's going in circles. And so there's that mechanical nature there. Um, and so the way that that little four note gesture kind of uh, defines some of her material and is kind of, it becomes more dissonant as the opera progresses. And it starts almost musical theatery in a way. It's very uh -huh. open and consonant and folky. And then it gets, you know, a little more, a, 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 a little less folk and a little more Webern as things go on. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that I, I really am excited when um, people are doing new serious operas about regular people living in California. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we so need that. I, I worked on, there was another Delos album that I produced um, by Mark Abel. Um, and uh, it, it's an opera, um, blanking on the name, it was so many years ago. But anyway, Mark Abel's opera. And it just, it, it takes place in San Luis Obispo and they're talking about driving in their Prius and, and just they're sort of middle-class people singing opera. And I just love that. And I think that's one of the things I love about Jeffers too, is that he, um, his characters are just, uh, I relate to them so strongly, even though, you know, it's a hundred years ago, it's, I still just relate to them very strongly. My experiences, you know, just, it really speaks, speaks to me in that way as well. And I'm excited when serious dramatic works are made out of it because it, it's, <laughs> it's um, so welcome, you know. Yeah. I have a question for both of you. Uh, would you consider working on a future Jeffers project, or do you have any any plans uh, to de to develop other other works of Jeffers into musical vehicles? I'll go on. This you go one. first. Okay. <laughs> um, I've I've been toying with uh, how to possibly tackle the bowl of blood, Ooh. and I've been experimenting with that as an electronic <laughs> opera. Wow. So uh, using live. Uh, digital processing, you know, singers with microphones that are being expanded into the speakers so that uh, the voices become their own accompaniment. And that is clearly something that will take a lot of research and a lot of time, but that's when I finally finish with the, the opera, that's, that's where I want to go next. 
Fantastic. Well, the first thing I'm going to do after this is go read Bowl of Blood. I don't know that so one. Good. I'm go check it out. <laughs> Very wow. timely. Very yeah. timely. <laughs> Sounds like a little light reading. It's great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so for me, you know, I have nothing specific planned. I just, again, I have inspirations in the back of my mind of things that I would like to accomplish. And uh, I would I would like to do some kind of a dramatic presentation. I'm not sure if it's a like a film or, or a stage presentation of Roan Stallion. Um, it, I mean, it's, again, it's got issues in it that dramaturgically are, I, I haven't figured out yet, but it definitely involves technology. Like Jessica said, you know, these, these pieces you heard today, they're, they're pretty, you know, traditional classical music, piano voice, you know, art song and opera. Um, but when you think about the, the technology that's available now and the kinds of things you can do, um, with sound manipulation and all of that, it gets very exciting. And one day I'll solve the <laughs> riddle and, you know, try to apply for a grant to do that or something, you know, but uh, right now it's still a, just an inspiration in my mind, but I would love to do something on Rhone Stallion for sure. Oh, it's such a great piece. Jessica, someone has asked if your four notes, your, your thematic motif for Helen uh, was derived from the theme from the Twilight Zone. Uh, you know, uh, I wish I could claim that, uh, but <laughs> that's not where it originated from, unfortunately. Um, it, it actually has a little bit more of a technical origin, um, and it, I'm going to switch a cable around and, and show you, if that's all right, one moment. I had to mute so nobody got blasted with the sound of cables changing. But for me, this interval, the perfect fifth, for me, for some reason, this is the interval that everything in Jeffers wants to be for me personally, my ear. So I always hear these fifths intersecting and moving around in various ways and so on. So this gesture, is sort of like stacking several fifths together and adding them up harmonically and then pulling them back apart melodically. Mm -hmm. And so that's where that gesture comes from, is very from that language of fifths. Yeah, very nice. And it makes sense that using the bottom of the overtone series as the foundation of Jeffers, which is all dealing with primeval, elemental, cosmic themes to have everything grounded mm -hmm. in a perfect fifth musically makes perfect sense. And Chris, you made huge use of that in, in the accompaniment for Distant Rainfall. <clears throat> yeah, it, you know, there are, depending on what the, the vocal line I had come with, up with suggested, there are various points that are, are what I would call, you know, stable intervals, like the fifth, you know, where there's a, a very clear root tone and, harm, you know, nice harmonic support of the fifth. Um, but as you alluded to earlier, Jessica, you know, those turn on a dime. Um, and so it's an interesting in our two approaches, you know, you as your embedded material, you've got these stable fifths that, that, that kind of are embedded in your melodic material, but the harmonic movement is all completely chromatic and, and um, at least to my ear, never really stays in one tonal region for any length of time, whereas mine might. Mm -hmm. um, which and some of the some of the critics noted that as well in terms of um, my album, they, they found a lot of things unexpected. Mm. Uh, you know, they just oh that's an unexpected choice and that's a you know because I'll be going along for a while and then it will just take off in a, and and embrace maybe even a different kind of harmonic language altogether. And I I just tried to be free with that and let that happen. And if that was my instinct, just you know let it be what it was. I think that's so cool. It's, we're, we're sort of dancing around the fact that there can be these expectations on living composers to be in very, very clear dialogue with our aesthetic precedents and sort of are go. you tonal or not <laughs> is kind of, you know, that's a thing. And so, yeah. you know, both of us seem to be using tonality as a vocabulary or as sort of a source of inspiration that we occasionally touch on, but it's not what we're limiting ourselves to. And we do that in very different ways, which is really interesting. This is a good opportunity actually to say that um, I think it was the, the preface to Tamar where he, where Jeffers declared, you know, I'm not a T.S. Eliot. I'm not, you know, I'm not a modern per se. And, 
and that takes guts, you know, when that's the um, when that's the prevailing culture. And for now, I, I feel like a lot of the classical music establishment is still stuck in this era of modernism. It's like sometimes I think sometimes I go to new music concerts and feel like, wow, no, they're like the Siberian soldier that doesn't know the war is over. They're still <laughs> out there for like six months, and, uh, and it's like some of us have moved on you know and I, I think that the aesthetic right now for me is just everything's okay like embrace it all and it can be all in the same piece as if it works you know and and it's what your you know your voice is telling you to do then that's what you should do and I, I felt like I was over all that tonal or atonal back in 1991 when I was getting out of college you know I, by the way, I pre appreciate, Melinda, that you referred to me as a young man. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, well, yeah, compared to some of us here, you, you're, <laughs> you're in the so time of your career. <laughs> nice. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's still a question, though, that, that every single composer has to grapple with. And, um, you know, in terms of having a career, you know, some, a, a composer like Philip Glass, you know, that, that he was very successful in the sense that he established a style that was original to him. And he just did that, you know, and it, it didn't change all that much uh, over his career. And that's an amazing thing. If that's, if that's what your, uh, you know, your soul is telling you to do, but uh, that's not for me. And I, I, you know, I do Hollywood film scores and I'll do songwriting and, and uh, you know, I'll write pop songs and cowboy chords you know, and, and then stuff like this. And so I try to embrace it all. That's great, that's great. So what is next on the horizon for you? <laughs> Jessica, you wanna go first? <laughs> well, I have to finish this opera. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, that's a little tricky to say. Um, the, uh, the available free time for um, getting through uh, creative projects has been a little bit reduced with online teaching. Oh. Uh, there's just a lot of extra hours in the day spent on uh, clicking and keyboard typing than, than I was anticipating. Um, but right now I'm taking a little bit of a creative aside to work on several solo pieces. Uh, there's a lot of musicians who have been unable to rehearse with their ensembles because of the pandemic. So I'm working on a series of solo trombone pieces for Paul von Hoff, and I'm working on a series of solo cello pieces for uh, Lindsay Schlimmer, a cellist in Minnesota. And I'm also right now setting a cycle of Betty Adcock poems, who is also a, a reader of Jeffers and an amazing poet. And uh, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun setting that cycle. So that one's got a deadline in January. So after that, maybe I'll be able to get back into Thurso. Yeah, terrific. And Chris, what about you? What's, what's on the horizon for you? Uh, well, mm -hmm. you know, I spend most of my days uh, working here in LA in the mm -hmm. film scoring industry, either, whether writing my own scores or, or orchestrating for other composers and things. So I'll, I'll continue to do that, of course. As far as my own composing work, I, uh, I have a singer songwriter album that I'm doing I, of these are songs that I've written over the years. Some have been for films and, but I, I decided uh, when I was kind of in my mid thirties to, uh, to um, take up guitar. I decided I want to start over on a new instrument. It's kind of like this child mind, you know, I just to, just to start fresh. And so once I started doing that, I thought, well, I'll give myself a project and do an, do an album. So, uh, it's taken a long time over the course of it, but um, I'm going to be doing that, and hopefully it'll be out first few months of next year. And um, what style? What what style? Or it's a kind of a folk rock album. I mean, I'm very inspired by Jeff Buckley. I, I loved his work, so it's, some of it's a little bit like Jeff Buckley's Grace, where it's solo guitar with voice. Mm -hmm. um, actually, there's a W B uh, there's a W uh, B Yeats poem that I set to music in there, but the rest of the songs are um, it's to the rose upon the root of time. I said as a sort of folk song in there, yeah. but the rest of the lyrics are mine. And, um, and then some of them have a band, you know, it's sort of a rock and roll band. So that's a departure from what everybody just heard, but that's going to be my next project. And, and there's another, I'm doing some orchestral arrangements of certain um, easy listening songs from the seventies that I'm going to pitch to some singers that I know here, but I'm going to jazz them up and, and, and make them a little bit avant-garde in the mode of, um, of Joni Mitchell's Both Sides Now orchestral album, which is also very 
inspiring to me. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's what's occupying me right now. What a, what a fabulous array, a, a range <laughs> of styles and projects you both work on. Some, someone is asking here, do you have music going in your head all the time? Or does, does, it, ever, does it ever turn off? Or is it there always something, something cooking, something brewing? <clears throat> I always have something going and sometimes that's a problem. <laughs> Sometimes I'll have the wrong thing cooking. Ah, and, and yes, I, I know, you know that. I, I've got a rehearsal on this piece. I need to write this music. Get out of my head that music. I don't want you today. And so that can be a little frustrating. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sometimes you, because of deadlines, you have to work on a piece that your, your soul is telling you is not the right moment for that. And you want to go somewhere else. But I would say there's always music there. And it's not that I'm hearing things all the time. It's just that um, it's really important to me that when you, you know, to not to be materialistic about music, that's something you create. It's something you can grab from out of the universe, you know? So when you get quiet, as I said, I just turn on the recorder and sometimes I sit there for a few minutes and then I just start singing and it's always there. And it's, it's almost like you just jump on a, on a tram. Yes. And you're off. It takes you to a different place. How, how has the pandemic affected you in your work? Both of you. Well, I think this move to more solo writing is, is one key thing for me. Um, I most recently was doing a lot of large ensemble and a lot of orchestral writing. Oh and of course, with the pandemic, that becomes very challenging. So mm -hmm. uh, it was actually kind of a huge shift for me to mm -hmm. suddenly switch gears from writing for, you know, more than 100 people at a time to writing for not just one person, but one note one at a time. Yeah. yeah. And that was a big shift for me um, and, and sort of a, ref a refresh or a restart in some ways, kind of going back to, uh, to basics mm -hmm. in a way and reminding myself the power that one note really does have. Mm -hmm. So it's actually been um, really valuable for me uh, creatively to have this kind of reset. Of course, I wish it wasn't happening, but we try to find, yeah, yeah, we try to find the silver linings where we can. And Chris? And for me, um, yeah, work in LA in terms of the, the film scoring part of it stopped for several months. Um, and that gave me, uh, not exactly asked for, but it gave me the time I was looking for to work on this album I was describing, because uh, I was looking for time to do that. I'm lucky because I can actually s still work from home. Because um, there are the, um, I, there's a, a movie coming out that's a remake of Top Gun from the 80s that I worked on. And the, the whole thing was recorded by people in their homes, the entire score, and it's a full orchestral score. So they, that was the, the composer's Hans Zimmer and he, um, he f always figures out a way to work, that guy. So that was great. Um, you know, I'd love to throw something out, which is to just talk about for me, what's so interesting that's happening with Jeffers in the larger culture right now. Mm -hmm. If you guys are up for that, I don't know if there are any questions right now, but I just find it so fascinating. I keep hearing more and more about um, people who are into Jeffers in unexpected places. I, th I think it um, is growing. And there's been those two wonderful articles. The, um, was it the Vanity Fair article and the San Francisco Chronicle articles recently. And a colleague of mine, Josh Milton from uh, University of Mississippi at Oxford has a Jeffers cycle on commission that he's working on right now. And these are, these are young composers, you know, and young professionals. And I think there's a huge movement because of the, the state that our world is in and the state of the environment and that Jeffers is suddenly seen as so prescient and so exactly to the point of where we find ourselves. Um, so I'm, I'm not surprised. It, it seems to be a growing movement in, in surprising places popping up. Um, do, in, in your research of all the text and the poems that you've read, have you ever come across a text that you felt was absolutely resistant to being set to music? That you, you read this and you said, ah, oh, this is impossible. This, this is just not ever gonna be set to music. <clears throat> not me. Um... Typically, it'll be more something like, I don't want to write that one. Somebody else can write it. Let somebody else do it. 
Yeah. Yeah. Or I'm not in the mood for that one or I'm not there yet. My technique isn't there yet. I I had that experience with Thurso actually, where I Mm -hmm. wanted to do the opera and I knew I wasn't capable yet. Mm -hmm. I need to go to grad school and get some more tools in my toolkit (laughs) before I actually try to embark on this. So um, you know, I, I think especially for Jeffers, everything that he writes is so settable and it's so musical that I think everything he's written could could be set, even if I'm not the right person to do it or if it's not the right the right mood that day. The stars have not aligned. But I, I have yet to read an unmusical Jeffers poem. Chris, how about you? I have to say that even in my cycle, there are a few phrases that are were awkward. Uh, that I found difficult to set. Um, in fact, I just grabbed the thing and I was like, I'm gonna look up science because I, I felt like there was something in there and it just reminded me, uh, he, um, man, introverted man, and goes on like, a, uh, he's being taken up like a maniac with self-love and inward conflicts, cannot manage his hybrids. Inward conflicts was one that I think I, <laughs> it's just, it's one of those, it's a very consonant language which could be argued as a bit difficult for music. Um, but it, there's, ne- there's never been a poem that I thought, oh, that's impossible. You know, it just, it, to be honest, I can only do it if, uh, if something that really inspires me. If the ideas inspire me and it, and it feels like I want to say something with it musically, then I'll do it, whether there's awkward language in it or, or whether there's difficulty or not. You can always get through it. You can always find a way. Find a way around it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's enough tools to help you do that. Yeah. I mean, the, for, in Helen's aria, there's this period where she's talking about vultures, uh, you know, yes, you know, devouring her and uh, <laughs> thinking that, you know, that's that's not necessarily the prettiest of imageries. And so, you know, it, for me, anytime there's one of those challenges, it's at, for me asking what's Jeffers trying to do with this. And if he's trying to invoke this kind of nauseating uh, dismay or pain or shock you know, with this gesture, what musically will add to that or allow that to speak? So for me, having a soprano suddenly go way down into their chest voice, the vultures, you know, that's sort of ooh, a little nauseating in the, in the body to go there after we're so used to singing up high. So yeah, it's whenever those, there's one of those challenges that becomes a, just a fun moment to say, what, what is he doing here? What about the phonemes or the sound of the word led him to speak this and then to say, ah, oh, that's right. That's what I want and go write it down. And so what that, about that, that sound is interesting. That reminds me of the, of the thought I had about you, about both of our pieces that they, a lot of times they involve big leaps in the voice. And that's kind of a, a feature of 20th century opera and going forward. But beyond that, do you, um, what about Jeffers? Do you, do you think that it, it, the poetry lends itself to that, to big leaps of, of uh, vocal you know, range and things? Well, if, if you think of composing with your voice, composing poetry with your voice, contour and, and pacing are the tools that you have available. Um, so uh, I dread it so I can't bear it, right? You can, you can picture somebody, I, I, I can, picture, I've got this sort of old black and white image of Robinson in my head, and I picture him sort of orating in the tower in a way, you know, uh, I dread it so, I'm like, boom, that's a lot of leap, I can't bear it, like, boom, you can kind of picture the way that that would be spoken or delivered, and so to set it without those leaps, I think, does it a disservice, so I think that's something we're both hearing, is mm-hmm. this tendency for what he's, what he's speaking and what he's writing down, it does have these leaps and that that prosody and contour is important to the line. There's a, an aspect of it too that has to do with, and this goes back to our rhythm conversation, but sort of conversational rhythms that, that are, you know, like spoken language versus metered out musical phrases. And, and I, we touched on this earlier, but I, I, I really, read Jeffers in a very conversational, um, I don't know, spontaneously rhythmic style. And I think that found its way into both of our pieces, which is interesting. Um, Does anybody know, are there recordings of Jeffers reading his poetry? Has you ever heard his voice? I have not. I wonder, I would love to hear his voice. 
place. That would be illuminating. Am, am, I, can, am I coming across for the please, moment? Yes, please come in. Here comes Tim. Here, here comes the wizard. Yes. Yes, yes there are uh, recordings of Jeffers from the, uh, the 1940s. Uh, there's a very interesting unpublished late poem fragment where he explains that he just loathed recording. Uh, uh, read his poems with great dramatic zeal. Uh, it's relatively um, understated. Hmm. Uh, That's fascinating. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, it seemed like we needed, I, I needed to, to add a comment there. No, I'm so I'm so glad you did. What I kind of imagined was someone speaking in a very quiet, almost monotonic voice. You've got very it. measured, very <laughs> deliberate, with without a huge um, dynamic range, you know, or any dramatic flourishes, but just very steady, kind of mm. granite-like flat down. <laughs> so. I would love to, if those, if those recordings were available, I would love to know. I'm sure many people would like to know how to access that, to, to hear it. I will um, try to get that for you. And when we send out the thank you follow-up to those who attended today, we'll try to get that information in that note. That would be fabulous. It would Terrific. be really fascinating to do a linguistic analysis of that. Um, Gracie, say good night. Hey, y'all. This has been wonderful. Good night, Gracie. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for your thank you both. Thanks. Thanks to everyone. Thank I really enjoyed this.